Don't touch that dial. AARP Michigan has some news for you. We have polled Michiganders and we have insight into issues that matter most to them in this year's general election. Stay tuned and learn about the priority issues for Michiganders. But what issues are really important to Michiganders? And to do that, I cannot possibly think of anyone better, more capable or qualified to answer those questions than our two experienced pollsters. And so glad to have you with us today. Thank you both Bob and Jeff for being with us on the show. Let's start a little bit about establishing your own criteria and your own credentials. When people hear about polls and surveys all the time and you know what the trust factor is like throughout the country. So let's establish you as the professionals that you are. Bob, why don't you start and then Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been doing this. Sure, thank you, Paula, for having us on. Um, yeah, so I, I am a partner in uh, a Republican polling firm called Fabrizio Ward. Um, I've been in the political polling business going back to the early 90s, so uh, quite a while. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes in um, how polling is done and how politics is practiced, practiced in the United States. Um, my partner, uh, so we're Fabrizio Ward. My partner, Tony Fabrizio, is uh, is Donald Trump's pollster, uh, was in 2016, 2020, and uh, is also involved uh, in the campaign in 2024. So our, our firm uh, does, we're, we're, we're the polls that you normally don't see um, th that help uh, the candidates shape their messages. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time. Sounds good. Thank you. Jeff, your turn. Yes, we, we are also the polls that you normally don't see, uh, but but on the Democratic side, uh, I am a partner at Impact Research. Uh, we have worked on the last five Democratic presidential campaigns. Uh, my partner, Molly Murphy, uh, polls for the uh, the Harris campaign. I polled on the Obama campaigns and the uh, and the Clinton campaigns. And and like Bob, I've been doing this a long time. I actually started in uh, in high school actually conducting the interviews uh, on, on the telephone uh, and and for the last 25 years have, uh, have been a partner at what is now Impact Research. I appreciate that. And then that just sort of goes to to really emphasize the fact that AARP is a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit organization. We don't give to PACs. We've never, ever, ever uh, given money to any candidate or any candidate's campaign. So uh, having said that and established that that baseline. Let's let's talk a little bit about what you've learned in these polls. But let me first just say why they're important to us. Why do we even do these? ARP even uh, conducts these polls, and not just in Michigan, but they do them in other battleground states throughout the country. And one of the reasons that we do that is to elevate the issues that are most important to those who are 50 and older, and and also to make certain that people are informed about what the candidates who are running for elected office, how they weigh in on these, those issues that are so important to those 50 and older. So we use that, this data in that way. We don't use it to convince anyone or try to persuade anyone, but just to make certain if you're a Trump supporter, if you're a Harris supporter, if you're an independent or libertarian supporter, that you know what the issues are that are important to Michiganders and that you make certain that your candidate of choice addresses those issues. So with that, let's talk about what you've learned. Uh, tell us what some of the, the key points were that you learned in terms of, let's let's begin first with some of the candidate issues. I know Michigan's a toss-up state. Uh, why is that? Why are we a swing state? What what constitutes us being a swing state? Well, I'll start. Um, it, it absolutely is um, a battleground state. Um, and that's true in both uh, the Senate and presidential races, which we'll talk about. I mean, why is it um, there are equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats uh, in the state. Um, and uh, that's been true now for um, the past uh, several uh, major election cycles. Uh, it's true this year. Um, we have seen a, um, you know, if we zoom out even a bit long, uh, longer, uh, Michigan had been a pretty reliable Democratic state. Um, and I think Donald Trump has changed sort of the identity of our politics. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more working class people uh, who I think probably were either not involved in politics or more, um, you know, lean towards democratic politics that Donald Trump brought to the Republican fold. And so that I like Michigan and throw Pennsylvania and Wisconsin in, in that mix as well. 
have become more competitive because um, there's people who, you know, previously were not identifying as Republicans and voting Republican are doing so now. And, and it's, it's uh, changed in such a way is that we have this sort of really even tilt um, that every race, it seems, is razor thin. Uh, and that's going to be, I think, the case this year as well. I think that even though Democrats had a very good year in Michigan in mm -hmm. 2022, you would still expect the presidential race, the U.S. Senate race, and other elections in Michigan to be extremely close this year. That's what the polls are saying. And in an AARP's research in Michigan, if you look at, at those voters over 50 who are going to be a majority of the electorate, 43% of them are voting a straight Republican ticket. 41% of them are voting a straight Democratic ticket. But then you've got 16% of them that are not voting a straight ticket. And so you've got a lot of older voters that are splitting their tickets that are going to be persuadable and that are going to decide the election. And so what are some of those issues that are most important to those 50 and older or just to Michiganders in general? Well, I think um, broadly, the economy is the dominant issue in Michigan, as well as many other battleground states. Um, you're going to have issues, you have issues that are very motivating to base voters on both sides of the political aisle, right? So among Republicans, um, immigration and border security is a huge issue. Uh, and that's true among older um, Republicans uh, uh, voters. And on the Democratic side, you have issues like um, threats to democracy, reproductive uh, rights, abortion, are really motivating issues uh, for Democrat voters, including older Democratic voters. But across the political spectrum, economic issues, personal economic issues, uh, are extremely important. You know, just everyday pocketbook issues like you know inflation, jobs. We we'll put Social Security uh, in that grouping. Um, those are the issues that I think speak to the current climate um, and what you know voters are frustrated about in their politics today really comes down to pocketbook issues. Mm -hmm. And so take Social Security as an example. Um, it's a big issue among um, older voters. Uh, close to 90% of older voters list it as being either very or extremely important. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, it's important to everybody. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so important is because Social Security plays such a big role in older voters in Michigan's lives. I mean, we ask older voters, you know, uh, what will Social Security be in terms of your income? Is it going to be a major source of your income, a minor source of your income, not a source of your income? 61% say Social Security either will or is a major source of their income. When you look at seniors, those who are probably collecting Social Security, it goes up to 70%. So huge issue. Um, and when you have, you know, uh, tough economic times and you're working on, you know, a relatively fixed income, these issues are super important. Jeff, why was it surprised me a little bit to learn that uh, the border immigration was such a major issue for so many in Michigan? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, that's something that we've been seeing in a lot of the states that we've looked at. And we've looked at border states uh, like Arizona, and we've looked at, uh, you know, at, at, at states uh, like Michigan that are nowhere near the, uh, the southern border. And we've seen pretty consistently that, uh, that you have immigration as one of the top issues. Immigration is an interesting issue because, as Bob said, uh, a lot of the concern over immigration is driven by Republicans, but not all of the concern over immigration. And one of the reasons why you see so many candidates talking about immigration is that it also does matter to a lot of independent voters. Um, I think that immigration has been a major part of the national news. Uh, I think that, you know, in a lot of areas, you've got more visible migrants, uh, you know, at this time than, than you've had in, in recent years. And so again, you know, immigration is, is an issue that, that matters mainly to Republicans, but also to some degree to independents too. But 
as Bob said, even though it is maybe the single most important issue, when you group together all of the economic concerns that people have, like inflation, mm -hmm. like jobs, like social security, like taxes and spending, right? Those issues are more important collectively. And they're certainly more important among the persuadable voters that are going to decide the election. If you look at those ticket splitters over age 50, it's really the personal financial issues that are motivating them. Yeah, and, and, and they're, they're not disconnected, are they? And whether it's immigration, whether it's social security and or caregiving and what that means for older adults and for people, the caregiving tax credit. We, you also pulled that for, for Michigan to see whether or not people wanted a little additional help in terms of a caregiving tax credit. What did you learn? Mm -hmm. that, that's another great one. Uh, as Bob said with social security, the reason that that's an important issue is that it so directly affects people's lives. And the same is true with family caregiving. You've got a lot of Michigan voters over 50, 30% of them over 50, who are caring for an older or ill adult or someone with a disability. And it's a really big commitment of time for those older Michiganders who are, who are caring for someone. Uh, you've got 31% of the caregivers who are spending more than 20 hours a week on it. And that's part of the reason why they are more likely to vote for a candidate that will provide support to those family caregivers who are usually working unpaid. Uh, it's part of the reason why they will tell you uh, why 69% of older Michigan voters will tell you that policies to help seniors live independently as they age uh, are extremely or very important to them in deciding their votes this year. But family caregiving is a huge issue. So Jeff mentioned 30% of uh, older Michigan voters are family caregivers. We know from other research that that is just, um, you know, a piece of it. There mm -hmm. are uh, substantially more who have done it and aren't, maybe aren't doing it now. Maybe their parents have passed or, or uh, situations changed. And there are still many more who are about to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they look at their cousins, their friends, their worker, you know, workmates, um, everyone's dealing with family caregiving. Exactly. And, and so it's, it's um, you know, that, I think this is probably the first time that both party platforms include planks that specifically address family caregiving. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, we're gonna hear a lot more about this issue going forward when it comes to campaigns and getting elected. Well, if AARP has anything to say about it, we certainly will hear a whole lot more about it because we've been advocating for more help and resources for family caregivers for quite some time. So we're glad that that is issue has been elevated. You know, even for employers, people think about it's just a family issue or it's just what I do. But even for employers, the amount of time that people spend away from their office, from their work or productivity to take care of a loved one, to go to take their doctor's appointment or, or whatever, it impacts everybody. It's not just you know, a personal issue for families. It impacts our economy. It impacts everyone. I know Kellogg Foundation did a study a number of years ago. I think it was like $7,600 in terms of lost productivity for each person who's a caregiver inside of a company. So uh, I'm glad to see that it is it is getting the kind of attention it deserves and that perhaps it can do something for all those 1.7 million unpaid family caregivers in the state of Michigan. It's an issue that needs our attention. Talk with us a little bit about young people. Uh, I think in the last general election, Michigan had more young people go to the polls than in any other state. So young people are paying attention. And what some of the things we've learned is that their issues aren't that much different than older adults, you know, financial security, you know, they do care about abortion, gun rights, but talk about what you learned about from the young people. What did the poll tell us? You're absolutely right. The, the economy is a huge issue for young people. Um, one of the issues that we see a lot uh, in, in these surveys and, and others is the issue of the cost of housing. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to say that, um, you know, among younger voters, housing is their social security, right? It's like that big issue that defines politics, um, like social security does among older voters. This year, I mean, what used to be a coastal issue, you know, uh, in the expensive, you know, markets in the East and West Coast has now become a national issue. And I think you're hearing that from the, the candidates talking about it. Um, the cost of housing is something we measure in this survey, um, and it's it's high among older voters. It is sky high among 
younger voters in terms of the importance that issue will uh, play in determining their vote this election. Do you want to add anything to that, Jeff? Well, I would just say that that even though we think of Social Security also as an issue that's that's unique to older voters, uh, Social Security is a lot about your values. It's about your, a statement of values if you want to protect those benefits that that seniors have earned. And uh, and in a lot of research, younger voters also respond to that statement of values. But all of that said, we do know that while younger voters are maybe more energized with the change on the Democratic ticket, uh, and while younger voters have turned out in higher numbers in Michigan in recent cycles, a majority of the electorate in Michigan is going to be over age 50. That's a, a, da a data point that every single elected official should pay attention to, correct? And no matter whether you're ready for city council or, or the president of the United States, everyone should pay attention to that data point because that's where the level of influence and success will come from is, are those who are 50 and older and their issues. Speaking of, of demographics and data points, talk about the demographics. There was some, uh, what I consider some significant differences in terms of African-American communities and, and, and some of the, their responses versus even women uh, and educated. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you learned about the demographics of the poll? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we haven't really talked about the numbers of the presidential race. It's a dead heat, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but if you look at, um, like, uh, gender for, um, there is an enormous gender gap, um, in, in Michigan, uh, among, uh, women, uh, Harris has a 13 point lead among men. Trump has a 20 point lead. Um, and when you look at, uh, older voters, uh, the gap is only slightly less. Uh, and so that manifests throughout the sort of um, the generations of uh, this gender gap. The other big gap that you, you see is an education gap. And this sort of goes back to the point I made earlier is like, why is Michigan so competitive now? Is that, you know, the politics of who we identify as Republicans and Democrats has somewhat changed. Mm -hmm. And the majority of voters who um, haven't attained a college degree, so, uh, you know, either some college or vocational or high school or, or, or not, um, the majority of them are voting for Republicans. Um, and in this race for president, um, those without a college degree are voting for Trump by 12 points. Those with a college degree or higher are voting for Harris by 15 points. So there's a big gap there as well. And you mentioned um, the, uh, the difference by race. Um, that's one of the things that I think we're looking at in all of these state surveys now that uh, Harris is at the top of the ticket is that um, among black voters, particularly younger black voters and younger black men, um, we have seen not as strong numbers for the Democratic candidate, for, for certainly for Joe Biden, as we've seen in lots of other elections. Um, and so that was, you know, one of the asterisks of uh, a trend that, you know, pollsters have been looking at. And I think what we see in the Michigan data um, is um, Harris doing a pretty good job consolidating um, mm -hmm. support among uh, African-American voters in Michigan, particularly among older African-American voters. She's winning. Uh, she's getting 84 percent of the vote. Uh, Trump's only getting six percent of the vote. Um, and, you know, while the third parties may not matter anymore, um, they were voting for uh, one of the third parties at 5%. Mm -hmm. But 86% number is, is strong. Mm -hmm. um, there's opportunity to further consolidate that uh, for the Harris campaign, certainly, now that there's, you know, a lack of third party uh, candidates. Um, but among uh, conversely, among white voters, Trump is doing extremely well, right? So among older white voters in particular, um, he's got a 14-point lead. So there is these sort of chasms, uh, demographics in our in our politics that we see uh, playing out in Michigan. Uh, it's not just happening in Michigan. It's happening in a lot of battleground states. That's right. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens, you know, if there's less third-party influence. One of the things that we saw in this survey was that it looked like the third party candidates were really hurting Kamala Harris with voters under age 50. Uh, you know, you, you had uh, a difference between, I think, in, in the full ballot, uh, Trump being up three points 
uh, with voters under 50. But in just a head to head race, uh, Harris would have been up by a point. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with a lot of these demographic groups that maybe Harris was doing better with in this Michigan survey, but but hadn't fully made up all of the ground that she might, because if you were to compare you know, the presidential vote with the Senate vote, there were still a lot of groups in this survey, including younger voters and independents, where Alyssa Slotkin was doing a lot better. This is, you're right, the, the, the key word here is interesting. So stay, so stay tuned. There's still so much more to come and you can find some of this polling data on our website, which will be shown on the screen. You can visit the screen, visit our website. I wanna thank you. This is always uh, just so fascinating to hear what people are thinking and, and what the, the data has shown, because it, it absolutely it absolutely helps uh, with our messaging for any candidate that you might be, uh, people might be interested in voting for. So make certain that you know the issues don't just get all caught up in the hype, but just know the issues, know what they can, how they can, just stand on the issues that are most important to you. Elder law, long-term care. David, tell us, you 33 years of experience, what we need to know about long-term care and or elder law. Yeah, so Paula, the, the, the key is elder law is not just about when you get old. Mm -hmm. It's focused on what happens as we age. Uh, and the sad reality of it, the joyous reality of it, the simple reality of it is most of us will need long-term care. Federal government says 70% will need three years, 20% will need five years. Okay, so it's a real, it's a real thing. Um, everybody wants to avoid probate, save taxes, get it to the kids. Well, that doesn't happen if you've gone broke doing long-term care. And that's exactly what elder law is focused on. How do we make sure that you get back some, not all, but some of what you paid in. And elder law is designed to structure your legal life in such a way that you don't go broke in real life, okay? So at what age should you start thinking about long-term care and or elder law? Um, I would say when you're a teenager, <laughs> but that's my opinion. For most people- I would agree with you. <laughs> for most people, 60 is the right, okay. seems to be the right age. We have people in their 50s. Uh, and so I have a little time. <laughs> yeah, you have a little, that's right, that's right. Well, but you know, I've got folks in their 80s who they're like, oh, I don't wanna rush this. I'm like, what? You're not rushing anything, you know. So, so one, the number one thing people need to do is contact an elder law attorney and ask the right questions. Thank you, David, for being with us. We appreciate all that you're doing. And again, visit the website if they want more information, correct? Right. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Many people are looking for alternatives for their loved ones. They may not be able to keep them at home. So there are some options. And thank you for being with us, darling, to talk about those options, particularly adult foster home care. Awesome. Thank you, Paula, for having me. I appreciate this conversation. Um, yes, it is another opportunity and option for families um, to have their loved ones stay in a smaller setting as an adult family home. Um, we're located a lot of times in neighborhoods, um, mature neighborhoods, um, nice, quiet neighborhoods. Um, the goal is to offer a warm, clean, safe environment um, and more personal care to their loved ones, um, help with you know, managing meals and laundry, like take a lot of that responsibility away from them. So when they do visit their loved ones, they're visiting them and not helping them as far as with um, bathing and working. You know, we take that out of the out of the equation for them, so that the loved ones can live a long, healthy life um, without any worries. And then also the family, they can come visit and participate with the the loved one without worrying about all the details. And that's a, a family within a family in many ways, right? Exactly. It's a intimate setting. Yes, it is a very intimate setting. Um, we call ourselves their personal assistants, our extended family members. Um, we advocate for them. And that's what direct care workers do, advocate for family members. And that's why we need so many more people to um, come aboard and help us with this, you know, advocation for our older seniors. Right, we need more direct care workers because we're, we're aging and that's a good thing. It is, it <laughs> and, is. But we need more direct care workers. So people will need to consider that as an option for their career. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. with us today, Darlene, and thank you for what you do. Awesome, thank you again, Paula. Hello, I'm Dr. June with Great Lakes Center of Rheumatology. Today I'd like to talk about a topic that 
gets missed quite a bit. Dental hygiene and how it relates to arthritis and autoimmune diseases. You might not know this, but what goes on in your mouth and uh, keeping your mouth clean is actually directly related to the amount of inflammation that can happen in the rest of your body. It can affect your joints, your heart, and even your lungs. It's extremely important to have very good dental hygiene, see your dentist on a regular basis, take care of any cavities, and if unfortunately you need a tooth pulled for one reason or another, do get that done. It's been shown to reduce the amount of inflammation in your body dramatically once you can clear out some of those infections and other problems that you have with your dental hygiene. So it's my recommendation that you very much have a very good uh, program at home of dental care. You see your dentist on a regular basis and you bring it up with your doctor as well. If you believe that uh, you have a problem with your dentition, you have a cavity, a pain in your mouth or something, don't just ignore it, but really focus on taking care of your teeth and making sure that you have good health inside of your mouth. Another topic people ask then is, well, I don't have a dentist or I can't afford that. Well, there are programs available. Please ask your doctor about that and a lot of them will be able to help you to find services and resources so that you can get the dental care that you need. Finally, the foods that you eat, the amount of sugars that you put in your diet have a direct effect. So please avoid processed sugars, rinse your mouth after eating anything that's sweet or sugary, and remember, brush often, regularly, and floss. Thank you. Transportation, transportation. When we think of transportation, we automatically think of CATA. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. What's the best mode of transportation someone should think about for a loved one? Sure. So CATA has two types of transportation services. Fixed rail are those 40 and 60 foot long buses that you see on the street. Mm -hmm. And those are scheduled to serve designated bus stops and transportation hubs throughout the system. Most people don't know we also have paratransit services that um, are curb to curb demand response services. But we also have Spectran, which is for individuals who are certified by a physician with a disability. So that's actually three different types of transportation. The general transportation that you get, that just the regular bus, the big 40, what did you say, 40? 40 and 60 foot. 60 foot yep. bus, and then the curb to curb, and then Spectran. How do you know which one's best for a loved one? Really, it depends on what your need is. If you have uh, mobility, the ability to move around and uh, um, look at schedules and figure that out. Uh, the regular fixed route services are the best and they are the most affordable. If you have a disability that makes it makes mobility a little bit more challenging for you, Spectrain is also a good uh, service for those individuals. And how much in advance do you need to call to schedule? You can schedule it as much as two weeks in advance, um, but it is a one day advance notice. Well, that's great information that everybody should know. So if they have some questions, they can just go to the CATA website and look this up. And that's right. Find out what transportation mode is best for them. That's correct. Great. Thank you so much for being here, Lola. Appreciate you. Thank you, Paula. Gosh, I love sharing this information with you. Hopefully you will love sharing it with someone else. Thanks for watching Real Possibilities.